Can I first just echo what Les said and said it's brilliant to be here. It's, a, it's a, clearly a wonderful kind of event. I'll get my plug in first. Um, I've written quite a few books, but the thing I've been interested in obsessively, one might say, for the last 40 odd years is agriculture, food and agriculture. And the latest book, which is on sale, of course, I did, never mind Amazon, is uh, this one, Good for, uh, what's it called? Good Food for Every... <laughs> <laughs> Good Food for Everyone Forever, which summarises... No, it doesn't summarise, it actually... Let me turn the clock the right way. Which actually um, tells you what I'm going to try and say in about 20 minutes. Incidentally, I would love to plug what I am about to say into the kind of scenario that Les has just been talking about, because I feel it matches uh, excellently our own experience, our being me and my wife Ruth. We started a few years ago uh, an organisation, not an organisation, a non-organisation called the Campaign for Real Farming, which exists at the moment as a website. And the subtitle of the Campaign for Real Farming is a people's takeover of the world's food supply, which is quite a grand kind of, uh, of an ambition. But it is necessary, it might be a long shot, but it is actually necessary because what I call the powers that be are seriously screwing up the world, and if we simply go along, as it were, as we are, then we are going to be in serious trouble. In fact, we're already in serious trouble, we're going to be in terminal decline. I used to be, uh, I used to think I was a kind, of, uh, a kind of Marxist and that the only way forward was through a sort of centralised economy and I've now abandoned that idea because it really does seem to me that the kind of things we want to achieve are best achieved by, well I don't know why I'm saying this at the beginning but I'll just throw it in so that I can get Les on side I suppose, are best <laughs> achieved by what one might call in a very broad arm waving way a capitalist model. Because the very interesting thing is that the kind of changes we need to achieve at an economic front, and therefore one might say at a practical front, can be achieved through mechanisms that are well recognised within a capitalist framework. And what's gone wrong with the present world is not actually capitalism itself, the fact that it exists, but the fact that it's been taken off along these it's absurd lines of the, the neoliberal market and, and the so-called global free market, which Leaves it is it's spurious at every level. I mean, it's supposed to be neo-Darwinian, and anyone who understands Darwin says it's got nothing whatever to do with Darwin. And even if it had, so what? The point is, it's an absurdity. <laughs> I, I speak as a I speak as a biologist, you know. I mean, I like Darwin, but it is it is. Oh, I've lost my thread now. It's um. <laughs> It, it is this that's, that's, that's ruining the world, not capitalism itself, but this dreadful, dreadful model of it that's grown out at, since the, really since the late 1960s, Milton Friedman and all that. So, let me start. The point is, what really strikes me in the present world is the huge gap between what should be possible in this world and what is actually achieved. And what should be possible... World population at the moment, seven billion, which is 7,000 million, American billion, that is. By 2050, according to the United Nations demographers, who are the best we've got, the world population will be somewhere probably between 9.5 billion and 10 billion, which is a fairly considerable increase, but it's not an absolutely dramatic increase. It's a big increase. However, the demographers say, the shape of the demographic curve is not this, which is what Malthus predicted 200 years ago, you know, a, a tremendous e continuing exponential growth until we finally crash. That's not the shape of a demographic curve. The shape of a demographic curve is this, sigmoidal, and it levels out. And in fact, the prediction is that the population will level out round about 2050 at somewhere around 9.5 to 10 billion people. And the reason it'll do that is not because of catastrophe, war, epidemic, all those other things, famine, because these things actually don't um, reduce population for very long. They have a tremendous crash and then a tremendous rebound. And in any case, they are, they're not what we want to talk about. But the, what reduces population or what sort of stabilises population is a conscious decision by people, or perhaps even an unconscious decision by people, that they don't nearly need to have as many children as they thought they did. And as populations, this is universal really, as populations become more affluent and as women become more free and all those kind of things, people just have fewer children. 
And the rate of growth of the population in the 1960s was 2% per year of the whole world. I've got Daddy Long Legs here. No, no. So that, the, um, that meant that the population was doubling every 40 years. And if the population doubles every 40 years, then you're in trouble in very, very short space of time. We'd be up to 30, 40 billion by the end of this century if that had continued. But the rate of increase, the percentage rate of increase, has been steadily declining. And the prediction is that by 2050, the rate of increase will be zero, the percentage rate of increase per year, which means the population is stable. So the task of feeding humanity is simply, and I stress simply, to feed nine and a half to 10 billion people, and to go on doing so probably for a few decades, possibly for a few centuries, before it starts to, uh, the population will start naturally to come down again. We can see for the first time in 10,000 years, since agriculture first began, that the task of feeding humanity is actually finite. And we can also see that it's perfectly doable. However, at the moment we don't have 9 to 10 billion people, we have 7 billion people, which is much fewer. And that should be easy. I wrote another book earlier, uh, a few years ago, called Feeding People is Easy. And it really should be possible to provide everybody with good food, forever really, uh, 7 billion people with good food. But in fact, of the 7 billion we now have, 1 billion are officially uh, recognised as being chronically undernourished, which effectively means chronically hungry. Uh, 1 billion, however, are overnourished in some hideous way or other. Diabetes is really the big one rather than obesity. Obesity is a sort of sign of things going wrong. Diabetes is the big one. If we go on as, they are, as we are, the population of diabetics in the world by 2030 will exceed the present population of the United States. And even the powers that be recognise this. Even Tony Blair recognised diabetes as a huge problem. Of the 7 billion, 2, 1 billion live in urban slums. Um, Urbanisation still happens, you know. We're being told that uh, movement towards the cities represents progress and all that kind of thing. At the moment, half the people in the world live in cities, which is about 3.5 billion, and 1 billion of those, which is nearly a third, living slums. So we're being told we should all move off the countryside into the town because that's progress. And, the main, and for one in three people, that means an urban slum, and that's, nobody's going to get on top of that. I mean, I've, I've visited quite a few urban slums in my time around the world, and nobody's getting on top of it. It gets worse and worse and worse. In addition to that, the collateral damage is absolutely enormous, and I won't go into it, global warming and all that stuff, we all know, but the figure that really strikes me is that something like 50% of our fellow creatures, half of all the 8 million or so species with which we share this world, are in imminent danger of extinction. That is the fastest mass extinction ever. Much faster than anything that ever happened in the past with collision of asteroids and all that kind of thing. That's what's actually happening, and yet it would be possible to feed everybody well, and it would be possible to feed 9 or 10 billion people well by 2050. In other words, we could, we could solve our problems forever. It seems to me, too, that agriculture... I mean, no, it doesn't just seem to me, it's obvious. Agriculture is right at the heart of all human affairs. It, you know, it, it, it affects our economy, it affects the way of live, we live, it affects the way we affect the world as a whole, and everything that happens in the world as a whole affects agriculture. It is right at the centre. If it wasn't for agriculture, most of us wouldn't be here. The world population would be probably about a 60th or possibly a 600th of what it now is. Agriculture right at the heart. Get agriculture right, and everything else begins to follow. And we're getting it horribly wrong, obviously, but my point is that at the moment we really are living in dystopia. And the simple truth is, perhaps it's my big do, if we get agriculture right, then we can move, as it were, in one giant leap, as near to utopia as humanity is ever likely to be able to do. So... It seems to me, if, if we're going to get it right, we have to start again from first principles. And to start from first principles, you have to ask three fundamental questions. And the first fundamental question is, what is right? What is it right to do? And that is a moral question. And my answer to that, and I'm sure it's the answer that everyone else would, in this room would give, is that it is right to try to feed all the people in the world as well as people can be fed. Nine or ten billion, that is, that, it is right to try to do that. Now, it ought to be obvious. It isn't obvious to what I might call the powers that be, because I've met plenty of people in high places who say, well, if one billion people are starving, that is because there are one billion too many people in the world. 
And there are so many people going around saying, no, the key to all our problems is overpopulation and lots and lots of people ought to die so that we can get on with feeding the ones that don't. <laughs> Grotesque nonsense, but that is in effect the subtext of what's being said. The second real question is, what is possible? Is it actually possible to feed, in, at the present time, 7 billion, in a few years' time, 10 billion? And the answer to that is a resounding yes, as I hope to have time to be able to explain how it's done. And the third question is, um, uh, but, but what's the third question? Why haven't I written it down? Is it right? What is right? What is right? What is possible? And what is necessary? Is it ne what, what is it actually necessary to do in order to feed everybody in the world? Well, what do we actually have to do? And the first question I said, was it right, is morality. The second two questions, what is possible and what is necessary, are both biological questions. And if we can answer the biological question, we've really sketched out what the problem is. And if we can plug the economy into the biology, then, as it were, we're cooking on gas. Now, the real question, if you're asked the question, um, how are you going to feed people, or all this about, pretty obvious that agriculture that can actually feed people and go on feeding people without wrecking the rest of the world has got to be productive. No question about that. We've got to produce a lot of food. If we're going to go on doing it, then the jargon is it has to be sustainable. And we also know that conditions change in the world. Conditions change at the best of times. Climate's been changing quite radically since Roman times and then in the medieval times and then the mini ice age of the 18th century, 17th and 18th centuries, and so on and so on and so on. And now, as we all know, it's changing again dramatically as it hasn't changed for uh, possibly for 60,000 years. And we are now entering this phase of enormous global warming. So conditions are going to change. The agriculture has to change with it. So in addition to being productive and sustainable, the agriculture has to be resilient. Now then, if we're talking about the, the how of it, what's necessary, what do we have to do, then we have to approach this as a biological question. How does the biology relate to the idea of productivity, sustainability, and uh, resilience? And the answer is easily, because all we actually have to do to achieve this is to emulate nature, because nature has been astonishingly productive for the last 3.8 billion years continuously, without interruption. And I reckon 3.8 billion years of do it Will, will do us, you know. So we could be asking, how actually did it do it? And also, nature has been astonishingly resilient for the last 3.8 billion years, because you know, in that time we've had ice ages and we've had periods at the Eocene when the world was tropical, virtually from pole to pole, and there were palm trees in northern Canada and all that kind of stuff. And all that time, nature came smiling through. So how does nature achieve this wonderful feat? And the answer is actually by being First of all, by being very, very diverse. And diversity gives you advantages in all sorts of ways, and very demonstrable by, by, by you know, simple on-the-ground science. You can show that if you have lots of species acting together, they, are, they act synergistically. They make much better use of the nutrients than if there's just a few. You can show that if they're diverse, they're much better at resisting disease because no disease organism can really get to grips with them. And you can show, of course, that they are much more resilient when they're very variable because, well, you can knock them back, you can reduce the number of species, but provided they're diverse, other things will always come flying through. So diversity is, is the first rule. And diversity, and the second rule is that the wild nature is very, very uh, low input. All ecosystems borrow from other ecosystems, but on the whole, ecosystems of any one kind make do with what's there. And the question then, and the third thing is, that wild ecosystems are very, very integrated. Everything feeds onto everything else, nothing is wasted. Now these three things of um, diversity and low input and integration, how do they translate into agriculture? Well, diversity in agricultural terms is called polyculture. And you grow lots and lots of different crops together, lots and lots of different kinds of livestock together, and they should be integrated, so everyone's, everything's feeding on everything else. In good old traditional farming, for example, the, the pigs were there only to provide fertility and clean up the rubbish and cultivate the ground. They weren't there for their meat. When they were used for their meat, they, they, they were eating the whey that was produced from, um, from the cows as you were turning them 
milk into other things and so on and so on and so on. And wonderfully, wonderfully integrated systems. So mixed and integrated farming is, is, is the imitation of nature. And the imitation of low input is organic farming. It doesn't have to follow the rules necessarily of the soil association, but this has to be what, what you basically do. Now, if you have systems that are basically organic and are integrated and are diverse, in other words, mixed, then they are very, very complicated. And if they're very complicated, they have to be labour-intensive. And labour-intensive in this context doesn't mean having millions and millions of coolies or millions and millions of um, immigrants flogging themselves to death. It means having lots and lots of very high-class farmers who actually know what they're doing because it's the complexity that needs to be handled. If you have a system that is complicated and, uh, and labour-intensive perforce, because that's what's necessary, there is very, very little advantage, in fact no advantage usually, in scaling up. So the farm that could really hack it would actually be small to medium-sized. And one arrives at the conclusion, not through reasons of ideology, actually, but through reasons of sound biology, that the only kind of agriculture that can really feed people and go on doing it safely forever is based on small, mixed, quasi-organic, labour-intensive farms. This, unfortunately, is the precise opposite of what the powers that be want us to do. The precise opposite. Because we live in this neoliberal economy, the aim is to make as much money as possible in the shortest amount of time. To make as much money as possible in the shortest amount of time, you have to be as productive as possible in the short term without thinking too much about the collateral damage. So far from being organic, you absolutely whack in the, 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 the fertiliser and the pesticide and so on. And in fact, it becomes an exercise in um, industrial chemistry. And modern agriculture, so-called conventional agriculture, is really industrial in chemistry on the field scale. You get rid of the labour, because the labour is the most expensive input and you've got to cut costs. So you basically you're looking for a zero labour system, if you can possibly organise it. You can't possibly have complexity if you have uh, no labour. Nobody can handle it. You just have to have big, big, big machines. So you're automatically, immediately not into polyculture and mixed. You're into uh, monoculture. Wheat, as far as the eye can see, piggeries are now being built that hold a million pigs. In fact, they already exist in America. Chickenries with a million birds are already fairly commonplace. As you probably know, a dairy has been planned in Britain in Lincolnshire with 8,000 cattle. Uh, 8,000 cows, and there are people now pointing out that you can't really make money unless you go up to 30,000 cows, all in one place. Absolutely grotesque. Can't believe how bad it is. And yet, that is what the logic of the economy tells you. And what the logic of the economy also tells you, of course, is if you've got zero, zero labour and high capital input with big machines and big industrial chemistry and monoculture, you want to be as large scale as possible. So when I used to work for Farmers Weekly briefly in the early 70s, and when I did a big farm in Britain was 100 acres, which is 40 hectares. Now anything less than 400 hectares is considered to be rather small. And two or 3,000 hectares is now becoming quite common in this country with one labourer per 1,000 hectares. And in Ukraine, for example, which some see as the future, there are now farms of 300,000 hectares. 300,000, which is about as big as several English counties and they're still thinking of making them bigger. And that is the kind of logic you get from what is called the powers that be. I've got, I hope, 30 seconds. Just want to say, how are you going to get out of this mess? I said at the beginning, people's takeover. And one of the things we discuss in this book, and one of the things that we discuss on our website, is the various steps that people, individual people, can take to start moving the power away from the centre, away from the centre, away from this ludicrous logic of the neoliberal market and back to something more human and back to something more firmly biologically based. I am supposed to be giving a, a, a couple more workshops and if we could devote one of them to talking about this whole business of, of the people's takeover, what individual people can do, then I think that could be time well spent. So thank you very much. <laughs>